I think so many people need to hear that, that there's something within them that they don't know about, but that will get pulled out when they go out and they show up and they take action and they put themselves out there and they try new things because you tried something new and it led you down this career where you became the pitch queen, where you developed this skill set that everybody in the world of TV selling wanted. Welcome back to the Investor Mindset Podcast. My name is Stephen Pesavento, and today I have an amazing guest in the studio, Forbes Riley. How are you doing today, Forbes? You know, uh, happy to be here. Very happy to be here. Thank you. You have an incredible story. I mean, you've sold over $2.5 billion worth of products, pitching products on infomercials from stages and helping other people learn how to be able to be the pitch queen that you are. Um, I, I love your story. It's really incredible. We're going to get into a lot of it, but just a couple highlights. You know, you were part of helping to create the X Games. You hosted at the Laugh Factory. You were an actress. And then you went on to teaching and pitching products on QVC and, and all over TV. So everybody from my generation and older knows absolutely who you are. They've seen you everywhere. And I'm excited to share with you with some even uh, more people. But before we get into that, Forbes, tell me, um, looking back your so Forbes, looking back at your childhood, what events or influences shaped who you are today? What well, was it you know, like I to be little Forbes? You know, I don't know if we have about an hour and a half to talk about that. And I certainly tell this from stage, guys. But as you're looking at me, who I, I deem by traditional sense, very successful woman. I've got two beautiful kids. My twins turned 21 yesterday. I'm in love with a man who is going to be Arnold Schwarzenegger's body double when he was younger. That we're, mm. That's what we're going to California for. And life is not gone wood good, but it always it wasn't always that way. And I talk about that you're the sum of the obstacles you overcome. I had two loving parents. I think that is a distinct advantage. If you've got that, count yourself among the lucky ones. I don't care if you're rich or poor, if anybody loves you on this planet, you're ahead of the game because I've met many people who've literally been thrown away and then left to fend for themselves. And that leads for a very challenging way that you think. So I was told that I was special, even though uh, when I was eight years old, we discovered I had a weird thing in my mouth. My teeth were all in different places. And for eight years, this little girl wore braces. And for two of those, I wore a tongue thruster. And for two years, I talked like this. And nobody <laughs> wanted to be my friend because nobody could understand me. And I mm. think I strive so hard for massive communication on every level, especially verbally, because I know what it's like to be trapped in your own body and not be able to speak anything out your face. And now I get to do it on stages in front of 10 to 20,000 people. Beyond that, though, I had broken my nose when I was a little girl, and it, my parents never fixed it. They, I, I don't know what they were thinking back then, but it grew very odd. So now you've got a little girl with braces, a weird way she talks, a broken nose, frizzy hair, overweight. My mom, God bless her, we weren't, didn't have a lot of money, so we had a lot of fast food. And mm. it was a, when you looked at me, you go, wow, seriously antisocial child. But I spent a lot of time dreaming and watching television and movies. And I got to tell you, Stephen, two weeks ago, I just co-starred as the bad girl in an action-packed Western feature film. So I'm still living the dreams of that little girl who wanted to be anybody but her. And mm. then my dad was in a horrific accident. I mean, it's, it's almost like it's a bad, it's like a bad movie. You go, if you watch this, you go, don't do all those horrible things to just one girl. She spent three, he spent three years in the hospital. But here's the turning point. My mom comes to me one day, we're at the hospital room, and she says, you know, we've, we don't have any money for college. We're just flat broken. I don't, you don't have a scholarship. And she said, but there's the Miss Teenage America pageant. It's coming to town and they're looking to create Miss Teenage New York. And I'm like, we both looked at me, my face. And my mother had this moment where she was like, yeah, well, huh. And Stephen, when you're a girl, at least I think so, one of the things mm. that you want to be is pretty. And when your mom pretty much lets you know that you just aren't, mm. it was heart shattering. I've never forgotten it. It was decades ago. And my dad's doctor turned to us and said, you know what? You guys have been through so much. I'm going to fix your daughter's nose. Hmm. I didn't think anything of that. I thought it was kind of weird. Crazy thing is I woke up two days later and I looked at the little girl in the mirror and gosh darn it, she was cute. Hmm. The nose was cute. The braces were off. My eyes looked bigger. And I said to myself, I'm going to win this competition and get a scholarship so I can prove, be proud for my parents. And the crazy thing is I beat 500 girls locally and I ended up going to the nationals and I was on TV with Bob Hope. And the moral of that story is if you dream it, believe it, you can absolutely achieve it no matter how crazy it is. Yeah, it's incredible how powerful identity is. 
And that identity that you had before you got your nose fixed, you were just dreaming about being this person. You wanted to be somebody else. And I imagine that's what led you towards acting. And then through this whole path of going down, becoming an actress, going through the rigmarole, all the challenges that go along with that, you made your way towards- Oh, oh let me share something with you. You know why you want to be an actress? Because you thrive on rejection. Because mm. every single day somebody tells you, I don't care if you're the prettiest girl out there. Christy Brinkley is not a movie star. She was one of the prettiest girls ever. It was never about that. And every day you go on auditions, talk, and this is the next part of my career, is it, I got work all the time. I got rejected all the time. That's what acting is. As soon as you got a movie or a television show or a play, you're done with it, you're out of work. You have to keep auditioning. And you're too old, you're too fat, you're too thin, you're too pretty, you're not too pretty. It doesn't matter why they reject you. But if you've got a little bit of a fragile ego, and Steven, your ego can only take so much. It's like going on a date and constantly told you that you're horrible. Mm. It only, you can only take so much. And it, on some level, it kind of broke me. And I found my way into a seminar of self-development. And that created a lot of the foundation of who I am today. I teach self-development training. Because not only just communications, mm. but self-esteem, how you look at yourself, talk to yourself in the mirror, get up in the morning and believe that you're worth it at all, in spite of people telling you that you're not good. You, it's a strange thing, this life. Remember I said, it's nice to have two parents who love you. Mm -hmm. And it's great to have you know a person, a partner who thinks that you're great no matter what. Because I gotta tell you, everyone else spends a lot of time putting each other down, making each other mm -hmm. feel bad, you know, posturing and jonesing it. And however, it's like, wait a second, how come your friends aren't really happy for you when you're successful? Do you ever notice that? You're like, yeah. Actually, my friend. Yeah, well, I'm kind of a little jealous now. Well, that doesn't help me any. I need unconditional love and support. And I will tell you of all the things that I've created, two things. I just had a graduation of a thousand students yesterday. And I spent an inordinate amount of time getting to know my students, hearing their struggles, addressing their pains, and pushing them to get results. They often say about me that for Forbes Riley, a friend loves you the way you are. Forbes Riley loves you way too much to leave you that way. Mm. Well, it's, I've found the same thing in going to these self-development events. It shows you another group of people who are on this path towards creating a better life, towards creating a better version of themselves and towards finding that, that light inside that you always knew was there for you. What, what was it that drove you to that first event and how did that change your life? Okay. That's a, you know, that's an interesting story. What drove me was ignorance. I had met somebody he invited me to a party. I was, mm. yeah, I was just turned 30. I was full of myself and I, I was an actress. I wanted to be an actress. I'd been on Broadway and I was out in LA and I had this, can you hear the aggression in my voice? Because yeah. they always say, what do you want? I wanted it. I wanted it. Well, if you want something so hard, you shatter it. And mm. this guy, I went to his party one night and he said to me, I also have a little bit of ADHD. I've come to understand that one of the things people with severe ADHD don't enjoy is mindless conversation you know that kind of chit chat mm -hmm. you do at parties it Hates makes me very uncomfortable I, I want to get to the point quickly and i think that got misinterpreted as being rude i wasn't ever i'm not a mean person at all but people thought that and so he call he calls me and he says hey i want to tell you something about the party last night i'm like what he's like my friends didn't really like you and you mm. know what i said being a new yorker pff, who the fuck cares <laughs> I'm like, oh my god i can't believe i said that but that's what new yorkers did right he said yeah. no no he said he said, I have a training, a, a thing that I went to that I think you'd really enjoy. And back then I had a thing about money. I grew up with no money. Even when I had some, I always walked around with this broke mentality. And I said, I can't afford it. He says, it's only $400. I'm like, I can't afford it. He said, really? I said, yeah. He said, you know what? I'll pay for you. Now, Stephen, here's how twisted my psychology was back in my early 30s. I thought because nobody does anything for free was my belief. This guy's probably going to want to sleep with me for the 400. That was, he never... Mm -hmm. And he never did. It was not even an offer. But in my mind, these yeah. were, so I was so glad I found this training. I get into the training and oh my God, it was, I, I didn't know there were rooms like this where you beat pillows and yelled and screamed about, you know, the bully that you had when you were in second grade and you ran around and it was a very physical training. And here's the crazy thing. I had let some of my beliefs go in that room. That one week I was 31, absolutely changed my life and set a course for my, my whole future. But then what they always do is they upsell you on the way out. Remember, I hadn't mm -hmm. done any infomercials yet. I hadn't sold any products yet. And I was going to get mm -hmm. a, a massive training in marketing on the way out the door. They said, hey, you, that was great. But now we've got the, the leadership training. We'd love to invite you for it. It's $900. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I called my friend insulted. I'm like, this was a scam. They just want my money. And he likes, he's like, didn't you get anything out of it? I'm like, yeah, it was brilliant, but that's just a scam. And I hear, yeah. as I'm telling you this story, what I hear in my students now, I hear people who've been hurt before and bring old baggage to new relationships and it doesn't work. And this time he said, look, I'm not going to give you the money. I said, well, then what am I supposed to do? He said, think about it. And I did. And this is the other thing about CEOs and and entrepreneurs. You have to be your own driver. You have to accept rejection and solve problems all day, every day. And I said, well, can I, would you loan me the money? He said, yes, I will. He said, and I'll even let you set the terms. I said, great. I want a hundred dollars a month, no interest. And he said, yes. Mm -hmm. I've never seen him since, by the way, but I have been on a path for the last 30 years of self-development, not only me, I've got, I've broken through some unbelievable things, but my joy now, Stephen, is to watch my students, my clients break through their beliefs to become who I always thought they could be. Well, I feel like I, I share a similar story in the sense that I had two loving parents, but we grew up broke. It was extremely challenging. There was a lot of very difficult times and things that happened. But when I got on that path towards self-development, it changed my life. I saw a different version of myself that was possible. And I found a way to meeting him and really being able to connect with him. And I think there's nothing more powerful than getting on that journey and staying with it. And I know you're helping lots of people change their life because you've already had massive success. I mean, selling $2.5 billion of it in products is incredible. I've watched you pitch over and over. I've seen your pitch training. It's amazing. But at the core, what is pitching? And why do people need to know how to pitch? Well, the funny thing is you just, you just hit on what I teach. They don't need it. Nobody needs anything. See, when you've got a product or service, you can't wait to tell people what they need. They need that new vitamin. They need this pitch training. They need that investment deal. No, nobody needs anything. And nobody buys anything because of what they need. They buy Mm -hmm. it because they want it. And it's a very interesting distinction. And I teach that at the core of everything that I do. When you're sitting across from somebody, you're in a crowd or you're on a camera, stop telling people that they need it. Get them to want it. So for one of the secrets that I've got, and I'll just show your audience, you've probably seen me do this, but I have a blank piece of paper here. And if we're doing it just audio wise, I have a blank piece of paper here and I have a big blue pen, okay? I'm gonna make a prediction and Stephen and I are gonna do something that we did not practice, okay? So Stephen, my question to you is, do you wanna see something cool? What do you say? Yeah, yeah, I do. Right, what does the paper say? It says yes. So I predicted, I knew what you were gonna say before you said it, how is that possible? That's one of the secrets to pitch. I never ask a question I don't know the answer to. Very often beginner pitches will go, so I've got this product. So Steven, tell me about your life or tell me like what what you like to work out. No, no, no. I already Mm -hmm. can make an assumption about you. And I teach a specific formula called UPF. It's the ultimate pitch formula. And it's got components called the hub, the grid, the drivetrain, assumptions, relatability factors, and springboard story. Now to most people that those mean nothing, but I'm gonna tell you. Every single day, all day, you pitch and you don't realize it. What is a pitch? Pitch just means getting a yes. It doesn't necessarily mean making a sale. You pitched me to come on your podcast. You're not paying me, but it must have been something I wanted to do. Why would I want to do it? Well, you told me that you know some of my friends that I've worked with who are in high places. You've said that you've got an audience. I love the timber of your voice, the name of your podcast. And I said, what? I said, yes, that's a pitch. Guys, if you're listening to me, please, please enjoy this. Pitching is a life skill. As a business skill, it will make you a lot of money. All I did on television was pitch. I pitched the 2.5 billion. I pitched Jacqueline Juicer. We sold a billion of those. I've pitched two to $5,000 a minute every minute I've been on home shopping. How's that possible? Because the human psychology of getting people to take out a credit card is what Zig Ziglar picked up on decades ago. He said, the secret to getting what you want or getting the money that you want is giving people what they want. Mm. Well, here's the thing. I have a fitness product. I'm holding it in my hand. And again, if it's just audio, you can't see it, but it's a silver thing with two rings, right? We call it a spin gym. Now I could tell you all that you need it because for the holidays, you need to have sexy arms for the summertime. You need to take off your coat and feel good. And you're like, wah, 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 wah. Steven, you know what I do? Pick up your arm. Literally pick up your arm for me. Now touch with your other hand, touch the bottom of it. Is it nice and tight? Or has it got a little bit of like a wiggly jiggly? And if you're a woman, especially, it's like, oh, that's not so nice, right? Yeah. Stephen, if I told you that you spin gym five minutes a day, three times, just five minutes, you wake up at lunch and dinner in three weeks, that will be at least 50% tighter. Do you want to spin gym now? You're, you're walking me down the path towards wanting one. 
Yeah. Now you're a girl. You're not my ideal customer. See, for my ideal customer, for you, what I would do, because Joshua, my husband, is a bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. And he uses this every day. It does not build muscle. But for him, he uses it a warm up. Great way to get your heart pumping. He'll do three minutes every single day. This guy is competing in Mr. Olympia in like three weeks. Mm -hmm. If he uses it, would that interest you? Yeah. Yep. Right. So that's what the assumptions part of my training is, is that even though you might have a pitch already set, I worked on my pitch, but I'm pitching to Steven's face and Steven is young and bright, or I'm pitching to my face and I'm a woman. That's a big difference. Women mm -hmm. buy, women want things differently than men do. Is that a fair thing to say? Yeah. So I'm gonna not do the pitch. I'm gonna do the formula, which has a couple of fixed components. The spin gym didn't change. I didn't change. The person I'm talking to is the one that changes. And so it's when you understand the formula, then you understand how to modify the pitch based on the situation and the people that you're talking to. And to Ching, that is why this man is successful. Yeah, that was, that was a great deduction. That's exactly what it is. And that's how I make sales. That's how I make sales of UPF, which have gone through the roof this year, because people begin to realize that if they could get their ideas out to the world, if they could sell more product that they're sitting in their house. And by the way, the beautiful part of my system is it doesn't require you to have a product. You do not have to write a new book or design something new. You can be a network marketer for somebody else's product. You can be affiliate marketer for somebody else's product that you love. And if you can pitch, you get paid. Yeah. Well, and that's why I, I think it's such a core critical skill that whether people believe they need it or not, you're absolutely right. You need to be focused on what they want and what that's going to do for them. But when somebody has the ability to communicate in the fashion format that you do, when someone understands the psychology of how to get people to move forward, to do what they want, to say yes, it unlocks so much potential because whether it's your relationships, your business, uh, or anything else in your life, you're communicating with people every single day. Even the ability to introduce yourself is a critical thing. And a lot of people aren't very good at it. And even the people who are good at it often get tripped up in saying things that don't matter. Do you know, if you're lucky, you all experience the greatest pitch. You know what that is? Will you marry me? That's mm. a pitch. The person mm. can say yes or no. It really, you have to make sure that you've kind of laid that situation out right, right? For the person to want to <laughs> join how long, yes or no, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it must be so bad when somebody gets a no of will you marry me? No, nope, I'm not interested. It's like, really? You, you misread that miss signal, didn't it's you? It's one of the most brutal things to watch on video. It's terrible. <laughs> I've never watched a no. I think that's funny. But yeah, I love how you isolate it. Guys, if you're listening to this podcast, you're obviously interested in investing, in making money. And I don't care if you want to learn to pitch or not. That's not why I teach it. Here's what you want. You want more leads. You want better relationships. You want to introduce yourself with confidence. You want to walk across a stage and sell from stage. All of those things are what you want. And I hold a secret key to that. And I call it pitching. So I want to pivot away from the pitch conversation. I want to talk about you, Forbes, personally, because I think, you know, hearing your story is probably one of the most inspiring things I think anybody can walk away from this with. Obviously, you should go and learn how to pitch and learn how to talk about yourself and we can get into some more strategies. But I mean, you're a woman who stepped into the world of pitching. You went from acting into this world of pitching, a new space for you. When you made that move, you know, when you're an actress or an actor, you're getting paid for the work that you're doing. Maybe you get some points in the back end, but usually you're getting paid for, for showing up. How did it work in the pitch space when you got started? How did you start actually going out there and finding these opportunities? And then how did you get paid to do that? I didn't. They found me. And I'm going to share something on your screen. That's one of my favorite stories. I didn't find this. This career found me. Mm. I was an actress and a television host. Uh, and I did a lot of that. And I really, I don't enjoy selling. I, I would be very uncomfortable. I taught you the story about money. And so I go on auditions all the time. And the funny thing about being an actor is that you are really guided by, by the hand of God. You really are. Mm -hmm. Leo DiCaprio was doing a sitcom called Family Ties when he walked into an audition called Titanic. He had mm. no idea that this $100 million movie was gonna change his life. For him, it was just an audition, it was a character. This is what we do as actors. And so I walked into a studio, there was a camera and a table and it said, sell me this pen. The guy in the camera said, are you ready to go? And I'm like, mm -hmm. sell me this pen, what the? And I immediately had a thought and something changed in my life at that moment. And it said, 
I don't think they want me to sell the pen. I think I think all the other actresses are going to say it's silver and you put it in your hand and it's got a click thing to it. That's not what they want. I don't know why I heard that voice. And I looked at the camera and I said, you know, it's a funny thing about pens. I went to college. I was only 16 years old. I was really young, a little insecure. And my mom would write me a longhand note every morning. I would run to the mailbox. Boom, like clockwork. There it was. And I realized about a simple pen like this, it could reach out and touch somebody's heart. Mm. Well, here's the crazy thing. And I'm going to share my screen because there's pictures to this, this story. Um, and thank you for asking because it's just, I think it's just a pivotal point uh, in, in my story. But there was the first pitch. The, the first pen was the pitch. And Jake of Body by Jake walked out from behind the camera. He grabbed my face and said, you're going to make me a lot of money. <laughs> I didn't know what he was talking about. Well, cable television had just launched and he had this idea of doing a 24 hour network and the last 15, it was all about fitness and health. And the last 15 minutes would be selling products. This is the job that started my career. By the way, can you hear that? I'm not sure if I shared it correctly. Yep. And if, oh, you can. Okay. I just want to make sure that you could hear it. Sorry. Yeah. 24 hours a day. Now get ready for the latest in sports, fashion, and exercise gear on Fitness Plus. Hi, I'm Forbes Riley, and today we've got a great product for you. Take a look at this. Hi, I'm Forbes Riley, and that's by popular demand, the best way to develop rock hard abdominals. Hi, I'm Forbes Riley, and welcome to Fitness Plus. Now, if you want to burn calories and tune your whole body, all in the comfort and privacy of your own home. So I'm feeling my thighs work. I love it. The pads close against the fly bowl. Hi, I'm Forbes Riley, and welcome to Fitness Plus. That, okay. Hi, I'm so that you're on TV. You're you're doing the pitch. You're you're doing this stuff, and you moved into this role. I mean, the details are are well, wait, obviously wait. amazing to be able to share. But well, let me so wait. let me finish this. So Jake, so so here's what happened. People would come to me with a product. I would write the pitch for them. I did that for five years. I literally, I'm an idiot savant when it comes to pitching. Nobody taught me how to do this. There was no onboarding handbook. I have no idea why you can give me any product and I can just pitch it to camera. Jake sold that network to Fox for $500 million. And then you said, well, Forbes, what did you do next? I didn't. Infomercials were born and there were no women who could pitch. And that's me standing next to Jack LaLanne. And it's funny you'd said that everybody your age and older will know me. Well, next year when Mark Wahlberg plays Jack LaLanne in a movie, everybody will know Jack LaLanne. And that one infomercial guy has grossed a billion dollars. Mm. So I didn't have to, this is the craziest thing. I don't know anyone who could tell this story. I never set out to pitch and I never had to look for work. It came to me as though it was supposed to be mine. And that's mm. what's funny about it. And at some point I had to give up my acting career. Um, it's kind of a long story, but I moved from out from Hollywood and I moved to where home shopping is. And I started pitching for everybody. Everybody wanted to hire me. Oh my God, the girl who can sell my product. And I had a skill and a reputation that it didn't matter what you gave me. I could figure out the pitch for you in, in minutes. And that's where the 2.5 billion came in. And it was like, oh my gosh. And I never thought about it. It just became, it was not a job because every one of those jobs was individual people, but word spread fast. And I was the girl to hire for about 10 years. So this is really, I think this is really important. Forbes, did you know that you had this incredible skill before you showed up to that interview? No, I, first of all, let me tell you something. I didn't know I had that skill the entire time I was using that skill. I was pissed that I was not acting. I wanted to be Julia Roberts and Sandra Bullock. And now yeah. as one of my friends said, well, you sell crap on television. I'm like, girlfriend, I just made $100,000 selling, doing a QVC appearance and you're slinging hamburgers. Which one of us is a better actress? Yeah. And, and so all I of a think sudden, that's so important because yeah you that that skill was pulled out from you you didn't you weren't even aware of it but you had this piece that was deep down inside i think so many people need to hear that that there's something within them that they don't know about but that will get pulled out when they go out and they show up and they take action and they put themselves out there and they try new things because you tried something new and it led you down this career where you became the pitch queen where you developed this skill set that everybody in the world of TV selling wanted. Well, and the irony of this is that prior to that, I had auditioned for a lot of commercials. Commercials are 30 to 60 second spots where you take a sip of something and go, oh, that's delicious. And I so sucked at that. And I would, go on, I would go on 10 of those a day and I would not get one of them because it was, to me, it was frivolous. It was stupid. It's like, oh, look at that. 
oh, this cheeseburger's great. And it was horrible. And when infomercials came out, there was a lot of words to infomercials. You had to have a character. You had to tell stories. You had to do all the things that I innately now teach that I knew needed to be there. And I'm going to, I love the fact that you said it was pulled out of me. And I'm going to share that's true for other entrepreneurs. I don't know, just because you want one thing, be very mindful. I didn't want this career at all, ever. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be getting an Oscar and be Julia Roberts. I wanted to be those kind of movies, little rom-com, play around with George Clooney and Brad Pitt and have a great life that never materialized. I did a couple of movies in TV, but never got there. And the universe kept saying, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. And then I, I'm in the National Fitness Hall of Fame, Stephen. I don't know how I got there. I've never won a fitness competition. I don't have any muscles, but I sold more fitness products than any person on the planet. Huh, that's interesting. Yeah, I I personally believe everyone was born or put on this earth with a gift. And most people, what they need to do is they need to go out and try different things so they can discover what that gift is. And it sounds like that magically happened for you after years and years of going out and doing the thing that you absolutely wanted to do. And then you ended up having a message. You received that message. And even if you didn't want to receive it and you kept rejecting it, you kept pushing back. It kept telling you over and over again, Forbes, you're good at this. You are needed. This is your gift. Use it, accept it. At what point did you finally just say, you know what? I am the pitch queen and I love it. Uh, Yesterday. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that's you know when i did okay that's a great point a couple of was, and i don't know if we have too much time by this but something happened to me i was in my early 40s hollywood is a horrible destructive place not only do we find out that men literally stalk and rape women but they tell you that at 30 you're too old and if you don't have big breasts and blonde hair you're never going to be a star i was told all those things i was chased around desks and it's very demeaning well one day i'm at the height of my career and i go to my agent my agent was a very nice guy by the way and i had a hundred thousand dollar contract to host an infomercial that i'd found And I said, please negotiate this for me. He calls me two days later. He said, I've got good news and bad news. I said, okay, what's the good news? He said, they love you. I'm like, of course they do. I'm great at this. He said, but the bad news is they want somebody younger and less expensive. And I found it for them. Oh, but the good news to that is they want you to teach her how to pitch. And I said, wait a second, let me check and see if there's pigs flying or hell is frozen over. Cause I'm not, you're done. We're we're done. I was so hurt at younger. I was 41. And when he said that, I said to the universe, I'm never teaching this. I have the ability to print money. I know what I do. I don't really love it as much as I love acting, but I can print money anytime I want. I've made millions many, many times over. Well, now I'm in my late fifties and I'm sitting here during COVID and I've got two teenagers who are doing high school in, in my house. And my daughter comes to me. She's been a digital marketer for five years before that. She's already made a ton of money. She knows that I've been screwed over, but by digital marketers, I can't get my message on this computer. I'm not online at all. All my money been made on television. And she said, mom, I'm going to build a company with you. You ready? We're going to teach people how to pitch. I said, no, we're not. She said, yes, we are. See, at your age, mom, what you do is brilliant. And now it's you need to leave a legacy. You have no competition. And I'm going to show you how to do it. And we sat and we pulled out all the things that I did over and over again. And she made me see that I had systems and tricks that I already that I did, but I didn't really quite acknowledge. Mm-hmm. We created an online business. And Stephen, we launched on a Wednesday night with 25 people in the room The next morning I opened our bank account and I said to McKenna, what does the K stand for? So what do you mean, mom? I said, well, it says 25 K. She said, you grossed $25,000 last night. Every single one person in that room that you pitched a thousand dollar training to, they all bought, you had a hundred percent close rate, mom. Mm. Nobody does that. They do five to 10 to 30%. You closed every person in the room. Steve and I did that for four weeks. My daughter at 17 years old, who's now the CEO of the company, we grossed a hundred thousand dollars in six, in four weeks. In six months, we're at 1.2 million. We got our Mm -hmm. two comma club award for one funnel. We made a million dollars. And so I became the pitch queen. I then set out and I now teach this too. I teach a course called Next Level, how to craft your personal branding because my branding was all over the place. And the funny thing is, Stephen, I feel like I've been guided by the hand of God. I was in a girlfriend's photo studio and there was this big old flouncy dress and I tried it on and I thought, oh my God, I feel like a queen. And she had this gold crown and I took the gold crown, you know, with no pre-planning, that's my logo. That's my brand. And it was created because I was guided to do that. Mm. There is something out there that I really do believe is guiding us. And, you know, it took your daughter, someone you love dearly, super close to you to, to finally wake you up, to recognize that 
you need to share this gift with the world. That that's the next iteration of your career is to actually go out and be able to help other people with that same skill. And that at that's the gift. That's why I'm alive at the moment. Because the greatest gift that you can give to people, I just got off the phone with a 31 year old who's having his first baby. My twins turned 21 yesterday and I thought, man, you're in for a beautiful ride. <laughs> but I think as an older person who's been through a lot, the gift of your life, the purpose is to share to other generations and to let them know about the quest and that it's bumpy and that there's gonna be ups and downs. And in your downest downs, that becomes the best part of your pitch. I raised a bonus son who was murdered. I gotta tell you, you don't want that story, but I, when I talk about it in the right context, it inspires people to take action, to live for today. And so I believe that everything in life happens for you, not to you. And if you view it that way, you make stories out of the worst parts of your life and you inspire other people to live their life. Yeah, I think it's so true. I lost my little sister four years ago and it was the hardest thing I ever dealt with, but it changed my life. It made oh. me more of the person that I am today. And when it comes to parenting, we just have a couple minutes left before we wrap. But when it comes to parenting, I mean, you've you've raised a couple kids. You've obviously had some challenges with the big brother and big sister program. Obviously, you're raising that young kid and, and he was murdered. What did you do or what do you recommend to parents when it comes to instilling in your children that they can go and do this because at 17 she helped you create this massive business and i know she started even younger yeah she started at 12 with her business i'm going to tell you as a parent the only way i'm qualified is i've raised two children who are 21 are healthy happy and successful one's in college the other runs her own business and they're both they both call me to tell me how much they love me which is that's the most successful part of, of raising children is number one, stop living your life through them. I mean, I, I actually, you know, I have a whole bunch of theories that I would love to put into a parenting book. And I know we do you have two kids, by the way. Not yet. Well, you will. I definitely I see will. that you're going to be a great dad yeah. um, and that your sister's going to watch over you and them. And so the crazy thing about these, I have theories is, I, and I'll just give you one of them. I didn't punish my kids. I made them punish themselves. I'm not quite sure where that came from, but my son called me not long ago in high school, in college, and he said, mom, I gotta tell you, the way you raised us, you did a really good job. And what that means is that as an adult, I said, look, I don't wanna be the one, you did something wrong. I'm supposed to spank you or ground you or I'm now the bad guy? No, you're gonna tell me what's the right punishment for the thing that you just did. And they were like, well, you should probably take my phone. I said, okay, if you think I should take your phone, I will. And the crazy thing is that instilled an interesting sense of responsibility that they began to realize at a very, very young age that there were consequences to their actions. And it was not, oh my God, I need to, I, I can't do that because mom will hurt. No, I find out you're going to create the punishment. And then it was a fascinating way to do that. The other thing I created for them was the I want game. And this is really interesting. I trained my kids. I used to train dogs. I had a dog game show on television for many years called Zig and Zag about dog agility. And the cool thing I learned about dogs is they, they have souls, they can understand you, they remember, they just can't speak English. So if you go, hey puppy, stop chewing my shoe because mommy's gonna get so mad at you. The dog is like, wah, wah, what is she saying to me? But if you say, look, here's a treat, give me your paw, there's the treat, give me the paw, there's the treat. They go, oh, guess what? There's a treat, gotta got a paw. Do the same thing with your kids. Train your kids, don't let them run rampant. One of the reasons I did that is because when we were checking out of a grocery store one day, I have two three-year-old twins. I used to really hate when moms would have to listen to, I want a candy, I want a this, I want a that. Oh my God, I'm like, I'm not raising my kids like that. We get to the checkout counter. The kids are about three. My kennel looks at me, she's like, mommy. Oh, I said to her, I said, can you grab me a piece of fruit there? We need something healthy to eat. We always focused on healthy food. We grew up with Jack LaLanne. And Jack mm -hmm. LaLanne always said, if man made it, don't eat it. So my kids would run around going, mom, did man make the cereal? No, yeah, man made the cereal, but God made the apple. So maybe we do an apple. If man made it, don't eat it. And so we're at the grocery and there's all that candy. And I said to my, both of them, I said, grab me a piece of fruit, find me a grape or something. And they, McKenna looks at me, she's like, mommy, there's only candy here. There's only sugar candy. And I said, well, why do you think that is? And she said, oh, I think bad men put that there to trick us. And I said, you are so right. And do you know what we did every single week when we went shopping growing up? <gasps> right, don't touch it, don't look, bad men put that there to touch us and it became a game. My daughter doesn't really eat candy, neither does my son. Not because I told them, no, they can't. They know they can. And then 
when we were at a party, she was 10 years old and she was standing around with a group of people and a mother comes up to me and says, you are just the worst mother. And I'm like, excuse me? She said, you don't let your kids eat candy or birthday cake. That's just horrible. You fitness people. And she walked away and I walked over to my daughter and I'm like, what's going on here? Did I tell you that you can't eat candy or cake? She's like, no, mommy. I know that I can eat anything I want. I just don't want to. So I blamed you. <laughs> That's the strategies to raising a kid. And I will tell you, uh, for those of you who can see the visuals, there's my queen of, of, of pitching picture. Uh, the chair. The dress was spontaneous, the crown was spontaneous, or was it fate? That's all I'm going to say. Well, Forbes, I have so many more questions for you, but we'll have to save them for another day. Thanks so much for joining us. Tell the audience where they can follow you or get in touch. Guys, I love social media. I've got 1.8 million fans on my Facebook. Just search my name or simply go to www.forbesreilly.com. Well, thanks so much for joining us and thanks for listening to this episode. We'll see you guys next week. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Investor Mindset Podcast. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. And if you'd like to watch another, here's one up top. And here's another great video right down below.